So great to be back, and uh, I was just thinking what to share this morning. I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me over the last couple of, uh, couple of days. I want to share a message with you that can help shift your life, shift your walk with God. It's called honoring the presence of God, honoring the presence of God. So I'm going to just pick up a scripture out of a typical Christmas scripture, and here it is in Matthew chapter uh, 1 and uh, verse uh, 21 through to 23. And uh, it's prophesying concerning the coming of Jesus, and in the verse it talks about one aspect of what he's going to be called. So here it is here, uh, she, that's Mary, will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus which means saviour, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning or translated God with us, or God is with us. So the Bible tells us there's at least more than a 100 prophecies by different people all through the Old Testament concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ. And all of these were fulfilled when he came. One of the prophecies that was spoken over him was his name will be called Emmanuel because God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to do is I want to move to just share a few things before I get on to where I want to go today and uh, where I want to focus on honoring the presence of God, why it is important, and then how we go about doing that, what you can do. And mostly what we can do is very easy, very simple. It's in the applying of it to your life regularly that you start to experience the blessings. So I just, by way of introduction, just share a few things so, you can, so I can lead you to where I want you to get. Uh, in the Bible, they're very clear right from the very beginning that God desires a personal relationship. When he created the earth, he created it so that he could express his nature, his life in the earth, and he decided to do it through man. So he created us, unique creations. We are a spirit being in the image of God, dwelling in a body. We have the capacity to live in the physical world and engage it, and also the capacity to engage with the spirit realm around us, the spirit realm of angels, of God, of demonic realm, or even the the realm of the spirits of human beings. So we live or exist in both realms. And God has made it very clear, he desires to dwell with us, to come near to us so we live and experience his presence and his power. The plan of God is that heaven would come to earth, not that we would go to heaven. So in the short term, when you die, if you're a follower of Christ, you go to heaven, but God's plan is to bring heaven to earth that earth will be filled with the people who carry and express his glory. So when we look through the Bible, through the Old Testament, we find there is a progressive revealing of God's plan. In other words, he didn't give it all up front. He gives hints of it. So in Genesis 3, after man sinned and the relationship was broken, then God spoke again, and he said that he would promise a redeemer who would come and rescue us. But there's more to the plan than that. As you walk through the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a developing book. So you can't stop at one point and say that's, what you, that's all there is to know about God. It actually unravels and it all finds its fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. So in the days of Abraham, people believed if you wanted to have a relationship with God, you had to build a physical altar or you had to go up a mount because God was up there. And so for many people, their thinking is God is up there. And so when they pray, they pray to God up there somewhere. And so it's it's a mindset from uh, Old Testament that God is up there. So you go on a high place, a mountain to get near God. And even the people who worship the occult would go up on the high places as well. So it was kind of a widespread thing. You want to get near God, go up higher. Of course, today we're getting a plane, go up really high. But it's not going to get you near a God. So that was just the way they approached God then. And then God said uh, in the days of Moses, he said, I want you to make me a house so I can dwell among you. So God expands the revelation that he's up on a mountain to now God is going to be in a tent among his people and the people would camp around the tent and the presence of God would fill the tent. 
And so if you read in the book of Exodus, you'll find they constructed a tent exactly according to the pattern. They made it according to God's design. And when it was all completed, a cloud of glory came into it. No one could even stand. The presence of God came in. And so everywhere they went, they would pack up the tent, take the tent on. When the cloud stopped, they would stop. The presence of God led them and guided them. They put up the temple, uh, the, the tent, and the presence of God had come in it. Years later, then uh, God spoke to David. And uh, in the days of Moses, the worship of God was very formal. In the days of David, God gave David a revelation that what he wanted in the worship of him were not all these walls and barriers. What he really wanted was for people to have free access to him and that he wanted the whole atmosphere of praise and worship to be built around his presence because that's what there is in heaven, heaven coming to earth. So David then replaced the tabernacle of Moses with a tent of his own making. It was not complex, it was an open tent. It carried and had the presence of God there and 24 seven, he surrounded it with worship and praise and the presence of God was there. In the days of Abraham, if you wanted to meet God, go up on a mountain, build an altar. In the days of Moses, you wanted to meet God, go to the tabernacle in the wilderness. In the days of David, if you wanted to meet God, go to where David's tent was in Jerusalem, where he prepared a place for the Lord, a temporary place. Then God gave David a download of a building, a temple, which would be a, a magnificent building beyond comparison, the inner part lined with gold. It would be a massive temple in the center of Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. And when it was constructed, then the glory of God came and filled it. If you wanted to meet God, you came to the temple. You understand that this is progressing all the way down. And then when Jesus came, Jesus said, well, I'm the temple of God. I'm Emmanuel, God is in me. The fullness of God is in me. I am the Word made flesh. This is what God has always been looking to present to you. The true temple of God is a man filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, everywhere He went, He was the temple of God. If you wanted to meet God, then you went to the, you went to the temple of God, which was Jesus, not the empty temple. The empty temple was torn down. Just the remnants and ruins of it are left to this day. But Jesus is the true temple. He said, if you destroy this temple, then after three days, I will raise it up again. He's speaking then of Himself being the temple of God. However, the Bible tells of Jesus, Jesus is the pattern son. He is the firstborn of many. And so now God has opened up through the person of Jesus Christ. He is our pattern. He is our example. This is what the temple of good looks like. This is what the temple of God behaves like. This is how the light flows. This is what God has always intended. God would be with man, spirit to spirit dwelling in him. So in the New Testament, it tells us then that believers, when you receive Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him and we become the temple of God, an individual temple and a corporate temple. So now the temple of God is a corporate body, a corporate body where the Spirit of God comes to dwell inside us. And so when Jesus, before He left in John chapter 14, I think around about verse uh, nine, He said, and He made a promise. He said, I won't leave you orphaned. I will come to you. I will pray to the Father and the Spirit that you have seen with you will be in you. So He gave mankind a promise, the promise of an anointing, a presence of God within us called the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of sonship. The role of the Holy Spirit entering you is to shape you, guide you, transform you to become like Jesus Christ, to lead you in your daily activity and to identify you are the temple of God. Together we form a corporate temple. Not only is the anointing put within us, but the Holy Spirit comes upon us that we might serve and minister to the needs of people as Jesus did. So we receive the Holy Spirit within us as a personal presence. He comes to dwell within us, live within you. He will never leave you. If you think you're alone, you're not alone. It's a lie of the devil. The reality is Jesus said, I will not leave you orphaned. An orphan is someone with no father. He said, I will send the Spirit of my Father. He will be with you and will never ever leave you. Wherever you go, you are the temple of God. Wherever you go, the presence of God dwells within you. You say, well, I don't feel it. Well, there's a reason for that. And we're gonna help you with that today. 
But wherever you go, the Spirit of God is joined to your spirit and so He sees what you see. He knows what you think. Every thought you think, He is aware of it. He knows what you feel. Every emotion you have, He knows what you're feeling because He dwells within you and shares your life with you. Everywhere you go, He comes with you. If you go to great places, He comes with you to great places. If you go to other places, He's grieved. He's with you all the time. If you have a struggle, the Holy Spirit knows of that struggle. If you have something you're afraid of, He knows what that fear is, He knows how it affects you and He knows where it originated from. If you have things that are damaged in your heart, Holy Spirit knows what they are, where they are, when they happened and who did it to you. He knows you intimately, so intimately that in Hebrews 4 it says, before Him we are naked and exposed and open, there is nothing hidden from Him. You have a secret, He knows your secrets. You have something you're hiding from everyone else, He knows it. He knows what's happening. He is intimately acquainted with you and He's come to live within you, to lead you and change you. And so because the Spirit of God dwells within you, you need to learn to honour the presence of God. Honour the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. We need to honour Him. To honour Him means to place great value on Him. That's a choice you make. You can neglect the Holy Spirit. Most believers neglect the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to lead you, to commune with you, to make Jesus real to you, to reveal the Word of God to you, to guide you, to give you wisdom, to coach you, to mentor you, to help you in every aspect of your life. Don't neglect Him. To neglect Him, to neglect your relationship with Him is to dishonour His presence living within you. If you go to places where you know there's defilement, you are dishonouring the presence of God within you. There's many ways we can dishonour Him. God wants us to learn to honour the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. Holy Spirit is not a thing. Holy Spirit is not a force. Holy Spirit is not a wind or a fire. He may act like that. Holy Spirit is a person with feelings, with thoughts. He is the Spirit of God and He lives within you. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Saviour, the Spirit of God became joined to your spirit. In the realm of the Spirit, you are visible that you belong to God. You may not think you do, you may be going through all kinds of struggles in your mind, your emotions, your heart, but the Bible is clear, he that's joined to the Lord, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, is one spirit. You are like a married couple, joined together. And as you're well aware with married couples, they have fallout sometimes. Maybe you're having a fallout with him right now. You wanna do something about that. Why is it, why is it important we honour the presence of God? You know, when someone important comes into a room, it's most common in courtesy and manners to stand up. When you stand up, you are recognising the person as a person of honour and value. Therefore, you stand as a sign of respect. It tells us in the Bible concerning older people that we should stand up when they come into the room. It's, a, it's just a sign of honour, a sign of respect. So there are two reasons, or there's probably many reasons, there are two reasons I wanna point out to you that it's very important to honour the presence of God, to honour the indwelling Holy Spirit. Here's one of them, because honour releases the blessing of God into every area of your life. When the Holy Spirit came to live within you, you were changed and you become a vessel of honour in the house of the Lord. So you've got to therefore guard what you allow into your life. In 2 Timothy it says, in a great house, there are many vessels, some of honour, some of dishonour, some silver and gold that you put up on a shelf on display as honourable vessels and others which you put your trash into. Therefore, make a decision, you won't be a trash can. Simple as that. Don't be a trash can for the devil. You're called to be something greater than that. 
So in 2 Samuel 6, verse 11 and 12, and it talks about the Ark of the Lord. The Ark of the Lord was a, a box covered in gold. Any of you seen Indiana and the, <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant? You know what this is all looked like. It's a box and it's covered and it's with gold and it has a mercy seat on the top. It had the Word of God, tablets of Moses in there. It had a sample of the bread. It had Aaron's rod that budded inside it. And uh, there were two cherub- uh, seraphim that were over the top of it. Okay, and that's what it was. And so uh, that's where the presence of God was. Now, there was a period when David had not yet built his, uh, his uh, he, he had not got figured out how to get the ark into his tent. And he had a massive disaster because he did it the wrong way. And so it says here, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed, Eben, the Gittite for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed, Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. And David went and brought the ark up from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. So what happened was they had a bit of a, a problem when they tried to bring the ark into, into the city of Jerusalem and uh, God struck the guy carrying it dead. And so that caused the whole program to stop. So they, popped, they put the ark uh, into the house of a man called Obed-Edom. And this is what happened for three months with the ark. Now, the presence of God filled his house. Everything in the house was touched by the presence of God. And the Bible tells us that, that Obed-Edom, everything that he owned was blessed. His whole family was blessed. In fact, it was such a blessing came on his finances, a blessing came on his family, a blessing came on everything that he put his hand to that it got reported back to David. The Ark of the Covenant has brought blessing into Obed-Edom's household and David was really upset because he wanted it in Jerusalem for the nation. He wanted it in the capital of the nation and so he set his heart to find out why it had not worked out bringing it up the first time. But here's the thing I want you to see, that this man hosted the Ark. His house became a residence for the presence of God. And when the presence of God filled his house, everyone and everything that he had was blessed in such a way others could see the tangible results. If you follow through the story of Obed-Edom, you'll find that he ends up being a gatekeeper in the house of God. He's actually promoted and you'll find his family becomes a large family. They all produce their prolific number and they all follow the Lord. They all became followers of the Lord. His whole household is blessed. Now, his origins are not so hot. Obed, Edom. Obed means the servant. Edom means Esau. He's the servant of the one who really despised the things of God. Yet here is the man that God picked up and his blessing came upon his household. Tells us that God's blessing, God desires his blessing to come into your house. Firstly, your physical house. God wants to bless every part of your life. And he wants the blessing to be in your household, literally, because you are there. In your workplace, because you are there. See, wherever you go, you're called to carry the presence of God. Therefore, wherever you go, God wants to bring blessing to that place. Some Christians got this weird idea that God hates all the sinners. So ridiculous. I don't know where you get that idea from. It's definitely not anywhere in the Bible. See, God loves people. And it's the goodness of God that draws him to repentance. So in your workplace, if you're an employer, God wants to bless everyone in your workplace because you are to carry the presence of God there. See, if you are married, he wants to bless your marriage because you are carrying the presence of God there. If you have a family, God wants to bless your family because you carry the presence of God and you know how to release that presence and blessing. If you work for someone, God wants you to carry the presence into that place, subdue the demonic spirits and release peace and blessing there. Everywhere you go, you're called to be a blessing. You don't, get a bless, you don't bless people by isolating, cutting them off, yelling at them, annoying them. You, you, you bless people. You bring benefit to their life. So the first thing, honor releases the blessing of God. Second thing is, is honor releases the supernatural power. You notice here in Luke 4 verse 1 and then verse 14, Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 14, then he returned in the power of the Spirit. So what did Jesus do? Jesus honored the Holy Spirit by submitting 
to his leadership. For 30 years, he had waited for his opportunity to be called into ministry. He had the calling, he needed the preparation. And after he becomes anointed with the Holy Spirit, he doesn't run off to do ministry, run off to do miracles, run off to do anything like that. Instead, he submits to the Holy Spirit leading him. Now, the Holy Spirit led him into an incredible place called a wilderness. If you've ever been to Israel, you'll see how horrendous it is. There's just nothing there. It is absolutely barren. And he was there 40 days, 40 nights with wild animals in a place of risk, fasting and praying. What he did was he prepared for his life ministry by learning and developing a deep friendship with the Holy Spirit. How can you walk into the purpose of God if you don't spend time building a relationship with him so you know him and you understand how he works, how we operate. He placed a priority on the friendship of the Holy Spirit. It takes time to get to know someone. You know, we got married, but it's taken me all my life to get to know my wife. It's a journey and you keep learning all the time. And in the course of a journey of getting to know someone, you want to get to know what they like. Do you know what the Holy Spirit likes? Then you don't know him very well if you can't say what he likes. Do you know what the Holy Spirit hates? If you don't know what he hates, how are you going to build a friendship with him? Your friendship is very, very shallow because you haven't got to know him yet. That means in the coming year, you could commit to actually deepening your relationship with God and start to study and pursue to find out what does he love? that really brings honor to him and brings joy to him, and what is it that grieves him and that he actually hates? Stop doing those things. You should know what they are. So <clears throat> Jesus made a priority of building friendship with the Holy Spirit. So how do we honor the Holy Spirit? Let's get down to the practicals. I wanna to talk to you then about thing, ways that we can honor the Holy Spirit and uh, that place value on his presence. So here's a few. Here's the number one, number one, desire his presence. Now, of course, we know that God is present everywhere. That's what's called omnipresent. But there's a difference between God being everywhere and God tangibly manifesting his presence so you feel him and experience him. So when he says about the presence, he's talking about experiencing the presence of God experiencing. So in Psalm 24, 27, 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So this is David, a man who pioneered worship in his generation that reached right beyond the whole uh, dispensation prior to Jesus coming. So, so David got revelation what God loves. He loves praise and he loves worship. And so notice what said, David said, one thing have I desired above everything else. And desire leads to pursuit. So the first thing to develop or honor the Holy Spirit is to hunger for him, desire him, long for him. Fasting can help increase that desire for him. Prayer helps increase that desire for him. But desire, God moves towards desire and hunger. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. So if you have little hunger, then you won't pursue God. So we need to, need to hunger after him, want him. How do you do that? Well, every day I cry out, Lord, I pray that prayer every day. Psalm 27, verse four, one thing do I desire of you, Lord. Today I seek after this with all of my heart that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in your presence, aware and conscious of you to behold the beauty of your holiness and to fellowship with you. You see, it's a prayer. You can memorize the scripture and then you make it your prayer and then personalize it that it becomes your prayer of hunger and longing for God. Why don't you declare your hunger? Why don't you spend a little bit of time and start to set a rhythm of fasting to start to increase your hunger, your desire. The more, it's a funny thing, the more food you eat, the less hungry you are. The more of God you have, the more you want. And so when you don't have much, you go for other things when you go, for, you know, if you eat junk food, you lose your appetite. 
It's the same with spiritual things. You eat a lot of junk food, too much media, you lose your appetite for God. You actually, it requires that you do things to feed that hunger for God. Number two, practice honoring the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Practice. In other words, it's something you can put into practice on a daily basis. You can fit it in during the day. It only takes a couple of minutes. And that is to just acknowledge the presence of God. Most people are not sensitive to the presence of God because they've got lots of blocks in their heart. We'll talk about that in a moment. But another reason they're not conscious of him is because you get too busy with everything. And your mind and attention directs your heart away from God and you don't become conscious of him. So what you can put into practice, which really helps, is to take a two-minute pause through the day once in a while, just two minutes, and stop and quiet in your thoughts and direct your thoughts towards the Lord, begin to express gratitude to him, appreciation of him, begin to pray in the spirit and thank him for being with you. And what you do is you redirect your attention to become conscious of him and to honor his presence. When you practice doing it, it doesn't take you long. Like even as I was starting to do it then, I could feel myself slipping into awareness of his presence because I practice it, I do it regularly. So to practice honoring his presence means to intentionally direct your thoughts to become conscious, God is with me. God is with me. It just takes a bit of practice to do it. So you still yourself because the problem is our minds are too busy. We're anxious. We're worried about this. We've got lists of this and that. Got the media, got the phone buzzing and ringing. You've just got to shut everything off. Sit still, quietly, redirect your thoughts. That's why it helps to memorize the scripture. Redirect your thoughts intentionally and then begin to welcome the Holy Spirit Thank him for his presence. Begin to pray in the spirit. And as you pray in the spirit, he is arising within you. The flow of his life is arising within you and you start to become conscious of him. So you can sit in the car and do that within a couple of moments. You start to feel his presence. Then you surrender. Lord, I yield to you. I surrender to you. Thank you. What an honor that you are with me. In other words, it's, it's like acknowledging that your friend is with you and that you appreciate them instead of just ignoring them all day. So what happens for many Christians is they want a, an experience in church to be the substitute for a daily relationship. An experience in church is wonderful in the corporate gathering. It's nothing like it. I miss it if I'm not here. However, it's no substitute for you building sensitivity to the Spirit of God daily. I just call it a two-minute praise pause. It's just a couple of minutes to stop everything, get your phone off, and just quieten down your thoughts, center your heart on the Lord, and begin to pray in the Spirit and worship Him and thank Him for His presence there. And I find when I do it now, I become aware of His presence very, very quickly. So we practice honoring His presence. You think about, you want a good friendship with someone, talk to them regularly. Don't just save it for a prayer time. He's a friend. He's with you all the time. Talk to him through the day. Talk to him. Stop. Here's another thing you can do to honor him is seek his guidance and direction. Ask him to guide you. That's his role is to guide you and direct you, help you make decisions. So ask him for that. Don't just sort of hold out and stay silent and do a man thing and go all quiet. Ask the Lord for help. Holy Spirit, help me. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to answer that. Oh, that's so difficult. I'm feeling apprehensive about it. Holy Spirit, come and help me. Give me wisdom for that situation. See, so if we don't ask him, we won't get. You don't have because you don't ask. So, so value his guidance even in the little things, just little things. <laughs> even getting a car park. Lord, help me get a car park. You understand? It's just a little thing. So, so practice listening to the Holy Spirit. And when you're planning something, put your plans out in front of them and give them time to show you if something's not right in them. I found many Christians, what they do, here's my plan, bless it, Lord. Hello? Well, actually, 
People come to me and they say, well, I've decided to go so-and-so and and, uh, I want you to pray blessing on it or uh, uh, what's your opinion on it? I think, well, my opinion doesn't really matter. You don't value my opinion at all because you've already made your mind up. So you don't value the opinion. You don't honor what I can carry to bring into your life. So go for it. You, You understand you actually can't treat God that way. You, you can't just come up with all your plan and then just say, well, Lord, bless the plan. You, it requires you, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your understanding. In all your ways, be intimate with him. He will direct your path. His role is to direct you. And he knows what's ahead. You don't know. You're taking a guess. So if you want things to work out better, then bring your plans to the Lord. It doesn't mean don't plan. Oh, I'll just wait to be led by the Spirit. That's nonsense. That's irresponsibility. God requires you plan. However, bring your plans into relationship and friendship with Him and talk to Him and ask Him to show you if there's something about your plans that isn't really right or in harmony with Him or that you need to change. And the Bible says, Colossians 3.15, the peace of God will rule or be the umpire of you moving forward. So I like to give a little bit of time, overnight at least, and then in the next day, see how I feel about it all. So when I make plans, I talk with joy. In fact, we've come to agreement now that if I make a plan without talking to her, I went rogue. (laughs) And I have found over time, it doesn't work out well either. I have stress I don't need. So no going rogue, going and doing your own thing. Talk to the Holy Spirit. Bring him into your plans. Bring him into your world. Ask him to guide you and lead you. Tell him what's coming up. Talk to him about it. He's, his role and assignment is to lead you. Your role is to follow his leading. Doesn't mean you don't plan. It means you submit everything to him. He's in charge of it all. See? Okay. And if he speaks to you, then obey him. Do, that's the very thing. If you want God to lead you, then listen, write down what he says and do it. That's the best way to develop sensitivity. Anytime the Holy Spirit speaks, don't put it off. Don't say, oh, I don't know well, that's God. Or I don't know whether. Well, no, no, don't go that way. That's, not, that's gone into reasoning. You know, you'll soon lose what God told you, and then you'll learn, oh, I should have listened to that. that. That went really wrong. That one did. How many know what I'm talking about here? Especially been around a while. Okay, here's another thing. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve him. If, if you want to build a relationship and honor the Holy Spirit, don't hurt him. You know, if someone's hurting you all the time, you come to the conclusion they don't really value you, do you? Isn't that right? So do you know what hurts them? Do you know what wounds them? The Holy Spirit is very sensitive. He's very gentle. He's very sensitive. He's very powerful, but he is sensitive. That means he feels things very deeply. So things that you say and do, they affect him. And he's living within you. You want to build a great relationship with the Holy Spirit? Study what causes him sadness. The word grief means to cause a deep sorrow, to cause pain to someone. Now, in a relationship, if you're constantly hurting someone, this is not a good relationship. It's a messy one. And the person usually, if they, the, the Holy Spirit won't say a lot. He will say something and then uh, give you a slight nudge. That's not a right thing. That's a wrong thing. And then if you keep ignoring it, then he quietly fades away and his voice gets quieter and quieter and you can't hear him until one day you realize, man, my life's a mess. Where did it go off? Oh, I remember back, way back there. The Holy Spirit tells you then when you went off. Now, trouble is for most of us, since we don't live conscious of the Holy Spirit, conscious of his presence, we're not aware when he goes either. That's a dreadful state to be in. That's a backslidden state. I remember going to a, a, a meeting. It was a men's meeting, and <laughs> I won't say where it was, what it was. And they had the meeting, and Bob was with me, and they sang for about 45 minutes. And I said to Bob, I said, I don't know which is worse, that they've gone 45 minutes singing and there's no presence of God here at all, or the fact that they don't seem to know there's no presence of God here. They got so used to living without it. And when you get used to living with it, never take it for granted. If the Holy Spirit lifts off, you, dumb, you cannot believe how hard and empty it is. It's like a barren heaven and you become very religious. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Here's a, here's a scripture, Ephesians 4, 29 through 31. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what's good for and necessary to build people up that it may impart grace to the hearers. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
In other words, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you are also marked by his presence as one who will be redeemed in at least the final resurrection, if not the first. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, um, arguing, evil speaking be put away with all malice. Now, you should follow that scripture through into Ephesians 5, and you'll find he has a lot more to say. But you can actually, from this, first of all, it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because he's the one who identifies you as a person to be resurrected. He, he's the Spirit of God. Don't grieve him. Don't cause him harm and sorrow. So what causes him harm and sorrow? Well, here's some things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Hidden walls you build in your heart because over time because of your painful interactions in life. Hidden walls grieve him. If you, some, if you see someone that's hurting and you love them, it grieves you to see them hiding what's going wrong and stopping you having access to help you. Well, this is why, like we've got a course coming up and it's advertised. They've advertised many of them. And it's to help you deal with the hidden walls of your heart. If you've got hidden walls, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Engage in getting help to face those things. It makes sense to do that. Walls of sin. Some people have got, when you, when you sin, there's a wall built in your heart that keeps God out and keeps you alone. That's why it says the wage of sin is death. It means you're isolated and alone. Get the idea? Okay. Give you, it, so, so walls of sin, walls of offense and bitterness. A lot of people carry walls of offense and bitterness. Did you realize that offenses and bitterness grieve the Holy Spirit? It grieves him because he's the spirit of grace who forgives people. It grieves him that having given so much to you, you are so mean and miserable and won't let others go and forgive them and let go the hardness of your heart towards them. It distresses him that the blessing he put on you, you keep for yourself and you're mean to everyone else. That's distressing to the Holy Spirit. God forgives you that you may forgive others. God blesses you that you may bless others. God heals you so you can share testimony for the healing of others. Everything God does for you is to go on to others. So when you withhold, you're a holdout, it's a grief to the Holy Spirit. You're getting real quiet now. Disappointment, walls of disappointment, walls of fear. Here's another one, they're very clear. Negative attitudes and behavior towards people grieve the Holy Spirit because he loves them. Now, if someone yells at your wife, you're going to get wound up. Why will you get wound up? Because you love her. And yet we can yell at someone and think it doesn't matter, not realizing that the Holy Spirit loves them and now you've grieved them. And people seem to do this without any, it's because they don't live in the fear of God and awareness of his presence. You can read those scriptures yourself. So negative attitudes to people, holding anger against them, holding judgments against them, holding ill will and trying to pay them back, all of that kind of stuff grieves the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be free of it. It causes sadness to him that you've gone on such a long time and never got rid of any of that stuff especially in a church where there's deliverance and healing. What about evil speaking, swearing and cursing, gossip and slander? Those things, the words, see, here's, here's something. How can you expect to have spiritual authority, to have words which carry the weight and force of God behind them if you use your mouth for other stuff? Cursing people, speaking evil of them, swearing, gossiping, running them down behind their back. It's no wonder you're powerless. No wonder. You, you understand you can't get away. If you want the life and power of God, we come into agreement and make the Holy Spirit our friend. And then what you find when people are walking with God, they just don't do all that stuff. They don't swear. They don't shout. They don't hold bitterness. They don't hold unforgiveness. They don't hold attitudes towards people. Their heart is free because they want and value the Holy Spirit. Get any idea? Here's another one. You, you go into uh, Ephesians 5, you'll see all of these things here. But the, the next area is personal defilement. Don't let your life become defiled. And it talks about specific things in Ephesians 5. One is sexual sin. Sexual sin will defile you. 
because you become joined through pornography to spirits and through and to unclean things or through sexual relationships you become joined to people you become defiled and grieve the holy spirit but not only that coarse joking telling jokes that you know are rude and disgusting it's like the holy spirit hates all of that stuff why why do it why get caught up in it it's just to impress someone when what we really want to oppress is the Holy Spirit. Envy and coveting what other people have, that grieves the Holy Spirit. What you're saying to him is, what you've given me isn't enough. I want what they've got. It, it's like, it shows a deep lack of rest and trust in the Holy Spirit's provision. Whoa. <laughs> See, so we need to love what he loves and hate what he hates. It, it tells us of Jesus in Hebrews chapter one, I think verse nine, it tells us there in verse nine, he says, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and a great of joy in a greater measure. Now he carried joy that was enormous. The joy, everywhere he went carried the joy. And it says why? Because he, he hated lawlessness and he loved what was right. In other words, Jesus' life, he loved some stuff and hated some stuff. We tend to love the things that are grievous to the Holy Spirit, whereas we need to just get rid of them. If anything grieves the Holy Spirit, if you want your relationship with Him to deepen and carry a greater presence, see greater blessing, just deal with it all. So Jesus made it His pursuit to discover what pleased the Holy Spirit, what grieved Him, and He made strong stands over the things that grieve Him. Okay, here's another thing. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. We get near the end now. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Quench means to extinguish or put out a fire, to stifle it or suppress it. So that's what it means. So you can be a good person, have a good character, but still quench and stifle the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to stifle? How do we stifle or quench or wet blanket the Holy Spirit? Well, there's several things. Number one is fear. Fear Fear of, what, fear of failure, fear of what people will think, fear of uh, people rejecting you or ridiculing you. Fear will cause you not to do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Paul wrote to Timothy saying, stir up the gifts inside you. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. God wants you to be bold, not to be intimidated. God is with you. God is for you. Who can be against you? See, when you have that attitude, God is for me. God is for me, God is with me, God is in me, God is helping me, God is leading me, God is providing for me, God is protecting me. I can have a confidence towards life. Think about it. So fear and anxiety, that'll quench the Holy Spirit. They shut you down on the inside, get you focused on yourself. Uh, desire to be in control. You wanna control everything, have everything all worked out. All of that will quench the Holy Spirit. You're making no room for Him. Over Busyness. People get so busy. Busyness is a sign something's broken inside you. Busyness is a form of controlling what's inside you. Busyness shuts down and stops the Holy Spirit flowing. Uh, over scheduling, over having, having no room for flexibility, no room for God to move, making no room whatsoever. That, that, that shuts down and quenches the Holy Spirit. Culture and tradition can quench the Holy Spirit. Culture and tradition are powerful forces that Jesus warned about that will come against God's spirit moving and stop you doing things. Oh, well, our family does it this way. That's family culture. Well, our culture does it this way. Well, that's culture culture. Well, our tradition and our church, no, no, well, that's tradition. See, you've got to go to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Don't let those things shut down God working in your life demonic oppression. If you're under oppression and you don't stand up and push it back off, it will shut down and quench the Holy Spirit. Think about it. Unbelief will stop the Holy Spirit moving. An environment of unbelief. Here's the last one. A lack of understanding how to work with the Holy Spirit will eventually quench Him. Most people think that God just does it all if He wants to, but He doesn't seem to want to because He's not doing it, and that's how they work. Now, that's not how it works at all. God authorized and mandated men into the earth, women into the earth to do things on His behalf. You've got to do some things by initiative. We've got to actually step out or nothing happens. That make sense? And then the last thing, we want to honor the Holy Spirit. We also honor Jesus because the Holy Spirit's work in John 16, 14 is to glorify Jesus and make him known to us. 
So Jesus, the reason that we're honoring Jesus, Jesus is the pattern. Jesus is the one who's our guide. Jesus is the one who we take the lead from. Jesus is our elder brother. When you're praying, Jesus is in heaven, but his spirit is on earth with you. Everyone here today, if you're born again, God's spirit is with you. God's spirit is in you. Did you grieve him? When did you last hear him talk to you? You understand, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, be a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered people. Pastor Dave was stirring the church earlier on. And the evidence is that the Spirit of God are ruling in our heart is there's a peace and there's a joy. I want to pray for a few people before we just have an altar call. And I want to just invite people to come. When God has spoken to you today and you need something of a breakthrough in your life, there's an area He convicted you on. You say, God, I've been grieving you. I've been quenching you. I want to put that right today. It could be an attitude to people, a way of speaking, something you let defile you. Whatever it is, you say, God, I want to deal with that. I want to put it right today. And if you know that you've got a lot of baggage, a lot of walls in your heart, why would you, why? Why would you stay that way? Why would you stay there? Is it because fear, if I bring it to the light, I'll be embarrassed or shamed or whatever? The Holy Spirit's not going to do that to you. If you bring it into a place where you can be helped and grown, your life becomes free. How tragic not to have gone through stuff, but to have been in a place where you could be helped and you never took advantage of it. That's sad. Very sad. But it's a choice. I can feel the presence of God here. And, and he, he doesn't judge us. He loves us. He always wants to touch and help us. That's the bit I love about Him. He's always ready to help us. If there's some of you need healing today, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to heal you. Some of you need freedom today. The Holy Spirit wants to set you free. Let me just pray for just two or three people, first of all. I'll just pick you out. And I want to just uh, pray for you for the hand of God to touch you. Because we need every meeting to have room for God to minister and touch us. So, I mean, come, just come there. Come, come right now. Yes, please. Come. Yeah, come, 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 come. That's right. Come on, just pray for you. Just come. Just stand over here. Just over here, this side. Now, just put your hand on my hand lightly. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, come and touch her. God wants to fill you with strength and fill you with encouragement. Been a number of things that brought discouragement and difficulty to you. The Lord has called you to be a vessel of prayer and a vessel of joy. To be overflowing with joy and encouragement to people. That's what you're known for. That's what has been a characteristic of your life. And the enemy seems to come in waves to try and steal the joy and try to take the edge off you. And the Lord says, he's coming again to revive you. You're not going to become weaker. You're going to become stronger and more filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. Touch her, Lord. Touch her right now. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The count of three. One, two, three. Touch right now. Holy Spirit. Fire. Fire of God. Touch her, Lord, right now. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit. There we go. Whoa. <laughs> there we go. Praise the Lord. Oh, you're leaving soon. Quick, come while I'm in the flow. Just come now quickly. Just, just the other hand. Come on there. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Father, touch her today. Thank you for Sandra, for her willingness to go to nations. Father, we today, Lord, send her forth with power and blessing and anointing. Father, give her a great boldness against the practitioners of witchcraft and sorcery and magic. Father, give her discernment of what they're up to, discernment of the spells they put on to people in Africa, and cause the Lord to arise with fresh authority, fresh boldness with miracles of healing beyond what she's seen before. I ask, Lord, that even as she preaches, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will begin to flow and touch the lives of people. I thank you, Lord, for miracles, even as she's preaching. God is speaking to you about expectation of a whole new realm of the Spirit, a whole new realm of function. In some of the meetings, going to be big numbers of people there. It's beyond you to go and pray for them individually. It's going to require that you speak and with authority to the spirit realm. And you're going to see healings. You're going to see deliverances take place without you laying hands on anyone. The Lord says favor and provision will, come, will go before you. And everywhere you go, you'll be greeted with favor. 
This time around, the Lord says, I'm going to put favor ahead of you everywhere you go. Now, Lord, just release your power upon her today, just in honor of the word. One, two, three, the power of God touch her right now. Holy Ghost, come on and fill her right now. Fill her. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Why don't we just stand? This is open ourselves to the Lord. I believe the Holy Spirit's here to touch many people. I want to refresh you. It's been a hard year for many. And perhaps things have got into your heart and you say, well, God, I want to end the year in a fresh place with you. I want to end the year alive and hungry for the Holy Spirit, ready to start the next year. Prayer, fasting, in the presence of God, setting goals, setting dreams. I want my dreams renewed. I want my spirit refreshed. I want fresh passion for the Lord. I believe we've got a great year ahead of us, but to end of that year, let's exit this year well. Let our hearts be refreshed by the presence of God. So for you today, why don't you make your way forward? You know, in some ways the Lord spoke to you today about grieving the Holy Spirit. You say, today, Lord, I want to get it right. Today, I want my heart to come back to you. There's walls in your heart and you say, God, I recognise them today. I need to deal with them. Walls of unforgiveness, walls of bitterness, walls of disappointment, walls of grief. If there's oppression over your life, you say, God, it's been a hard season for me, but I'm coming to the Holy Spirit. If you've drawn back from your ministry, drawn back from serving passionately, you say, God, I'm coming back to you today. I'm coming for a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. I want your power to come on me now. If you know you've been grieving the Holy Spirit in the words you've spoken, the way you've treated people, holding attitudes, unforgiveness, bitterness, dishonouring people with the way you've treated them. Just repent of it. No one's going to ask you about it. You repent of it. Just talk to Jesus about it right now. Ask Him to forgive you for what you've said, what you've done. If there's defilement in your life, sexual uncleanness, joking and ways of talking, swearing, there's things in your life and you say, God, I want to be free of all those things. I coming and repenting. I want a life that honours the presence of God. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to live defiled anymore. I want to live a vessel of honour. Honour to your name. Make your way up. Just come if that's you. While we're just worshipping the Lord, put your heart right. While you're standing there, talk to the Lord. Tell Him what you need. Tell Him what it is. Talk to Him right now. Put it right with Him. And then the presence of God's going to come. Father, we thank You for Your presence here today. Thank You for so many responding today. Thank You, Lord. I thank You for this church. We bless this church. We bless the people. Father, we're praying for a fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit today and a fresh encounters through the coming year. In the coming year, we're looking for a fresh visitation of God. Increased deliverance, increased healings, increased miracles, increased breakthroughs. Come on, let's begin to worship the Lord together. While we're worshiping together, I'm going to pray a prayer over you. I'd like our ministry team come up, get ready to lay hands on people. Come on, let's declare worthy. Worthy are you, Lord. You're worthy. If you need to return to Jesus, you've stopped following Him. Something stumbled you. Make your way to the front and say, Jesus, I'm coming back. Worthy, worthy, worthy Lord. Come on, church, let's worship. Worship Him. Don't look at who's coming up. Pray for who's come up. Yes, Lord. Worthy. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I speak in the spirit realm. I take authority now over every spirit of witchcraft, every oppressive spirit, fear, anxiety, infirmity, defiling unclean spirits, spirits of bitterness and anger and hatred, spirits of grief, spirits that torment, spirits that come into the mind, tormenting and robbing peace. I command you when I count to three to loose and go in Jesus' name. One, two, three, loose. Loose now in Jesus' name. Loose. 
Come on, worship the Lord. Ministry team, please come pray.